Hi, it's Jen from Shabby Fabrics. Today I'm going to show you how fun and easy wool applique is. You may have always been working with cotton fabric and said, wool is not for me, I don't understand how to work with wool. And that was me for a long time. And then I just said, you know what, I love the look of wool. I'm going to figure out how it works. And you know what, it's so much fun. It's so easy. I can't wait to show you really how to do wool applique. Now the projects displayed behind me are the Shabby Mats Club. Our team of designers here have come up with 12 projects, one for each month, and each one of course just celebrates the sweetness and those most iconic parts of that month. And it's just been so much fun. So I wanted to show you if you've if you maybe been interested in wool but just don't really know how it works, let me let me show you the journey and you're just gonna I think you're gonna fall in love with it. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, and of course, just the dimension of wool is different than cotton fabric. It's raised. I love adding beautiful embroidery thread on top of that to just even further accentuate the beauty of wool. So I'll just go at first a little overview of what we'll be using and then we're going to jump right into, I'll just be demonstrating how to, for example, cut out the scallop shape of wool. How do you do that? Um, and then of course, applique. So on the table with me today is, of course, uh, the March project, and I'll be showing you how to put together the daffodil using a light box and the applique pressing sheet. And it's just like basically fusible applique, except you're going to be using wool. I have with me freesia paper. I love using the cut right, uh, it's a kind of a heavy duty freesia paper for my shapes, but it's an eight and a half by 11 footprint and these are almost a 16 inch diameter. So this is one of those cases where buying the big box of freezer paper from the grocery store is actually perfect. And I'll show you how to get your shape drawn out and get that transferred to your wool and you'll be able to use that template multiple times. We'll certainly be using an applique pressing sheet. I love the Fonz and Porter applique pressing sheet and I love that it has a little storage tube for me, once I'm done with it with each project, I just roll that right back up and put it inside here. I love that it's all compact and I know exactly where it is when I want to use it. We'll be using a little bit of heat and bond light. I always like to put a little bit of fusible on the back of my applique shapes, even for wool. I like to have those completely down to the background. So when I am uh, appliquing it down to the background, either by machine or by hand, those pieces are absolutely down to the background. We'll be going into more of that a little bit later on. Uh, I'd love to use uh, a nice pair of sharp scissors for cutting out my wool. I want to just get a real clean cut. I love the Kai scissors for that purpose. I just think they go through wool beautifully and they disturb it as little as possible. We have some two different needles. One is for going um, and stitching down the applique by hand if you want to do that. What I love about the 30 weight thread, which is in this box here, we've put together the thread uh, from the Sulky 30 weight cotton. And what's neat about this is, excuse me, this is a 12 weight cotton. This is a 12 weight, this is even a heavier cotton. If you want to do this by machine, we have a Schmetz size 100, it's the super non-stick needle, it's fantastic. So if you're like, I really just don't want to applique these shapes down to the background by hand, that's no problem. This machine can work either by hand or by machine. If you are gonna use it by machine, you'll be wanting to use those size 100 super non-stick needles and it just goes through the machine beautifully. And again, it can be used by hand. And if you wanna use that by hand, we've got some special needles for you. We also have some other needles for doing the beautiful embroidery, which is accentuated. Let me show you on this one here. It's really highlighted on the Christmas one with this beautiful variegated thread. We'll have some special marking pens for marking on black. That's the Uchida white marking pen. For the March project, which we'll be doing today, I, wasn't, I didn't use this, but for other um, months of the program, such as this one with the Christmas bells, I definitely needed something that would mark beautifully on the black wool, and we found this to work really, really well. Our standard friction pen, you've seen me use that many times, the Micron, I have my Clover needle shredder, anything to just help me get my needles threaded, especially with my heavier weight embroidery uh, 
threads, I like to use that clover needle threader and a little bit of the thread magic. It just coats it, makes it just a little bit easier to do the hand embroidery. So let me put that aside for now, and we're gonna jump right into how do we get this set up? So let's say you fall in love with these projects. I wanna do this. What do I do next, Jen? That's my job now, is just to help you learn how quick and simple and really easy and fun it is to prepare wool applique. There's nothing to it. And here's the best part. You don't have to turn the edges under. Just the nature of wool is it just doesn't fray. So unlike cotton where you really have to secure that edge, here it's not so much that way. It really just doesn't fray. And you're gonna make a clean cut. We certainly stitch the edge down, but it just doesn't fray. And so that's one of the added benefits to using wool. Of course, when you join our club, you'll be getting each of these and you'll always get them the month ahead of time. So here's a kit, for example. You've got your pattern in the front and all of your beautiful wool is in the back. These kits have wool for the front and wool for the back and of course, all of your wool applique is here. So let's put that aside for now as well. And inside your pattern, inside any pattern that you'll be receiving, you'll be having, of course, your diagram. Now this is our layout diagram here, and there's two pages. We went ahead and just taped that together ahead of time. Now let me get out this sheet here. This is what we use here for tracing. These are reversed for fusible applique. So if you're going to be using a fusible product such as heat and bond light, which I, is what I love to use, you'll be wanting to trace your shapes from the wool cutting guide. That way, since these are reversed, uh, when you put them down to the background, you will have the proper orientation. If, for example, you don't want to use fusible applique, for whatever reason, you don't want any kind of fusible product on your wool, some people feel that way, you would go ahead and trace your shapes out directly from the layout diagram because they're not reversed. So let me put the layout diagram aside for now. And we'll just grab a piece of our fusible webbing, and this is when we'll bring our light box into play. Our wool pressing mat will come into play just a little bit later on. I'll put that up here for now. And let me bring this over. I'll just rotate that so that's more in front of me. Now this is the daylight too. I love to have a nice illuminated light box underneath my diagrams. It helps me see through easily and trace whatever I need to trace. So you just put your diagram on here, one page at a time. Grab a piece of your fusible webbing. Let's grab that here. And this is where you, you want to make sure that you're not using a friction pen. I've done this before, felt pretty silly, because of course with a friction pen, anytime you add heat, the lines disappear. So this is where you'd maybe want to use a pencil, you might want to use a micron pen here, um, you know, a marking pen, whatever you want to use. In fact, I'll use a micron pen. I like to have that. This is a permanent marking pen. So whenever you want a line to be absolutely permanent or you're working with heat, uh, this is the kind of pen you want to be using. Now, I think you can see from the overhead camera, I have my diagram down, and I can move my applique pressing sheet out of the way for now. That will come into play a little bit later. I can certainly see my shape underneath there. Let me move that out of the way. But watch when I turn my light box on, just how much easier I can see that. So that's why I love using the light box and I use it over and over. Let me just move that so that logo's out of the way. And you're just gonna trace on the lines, just as you would suspect. I'll just trace one shape here, just kind of roughly trace around it, just for speed. Of course, you're gonna want to trace exactly on that line. And you would continue to trace. Notice how we have, this is for the gold, this is saying all of, your, all of your shapes, you trace them all at the same time. Wool is very expensive, especially hand-dyed wool. So unlike maybe a cotton kit, where there's a lot of extra fabric, with wool, it's very little extra fabric. That's why we at Shabby Fabrics, whenever you buy a, typically a kit uh, from us that's, that we've created, we give you the footprint so that helps you know how to trace your shapes and keep them nice and consolidated so that you make sure you get all of your shapes out of the wool 
and you, you're not short. So after you have, of course, you'd have traced out all of that, all at the same time, you'll just roughly cut around that. Don't cut exactly on the line at this point. You're just gonna roughly cut around that. And then you would just iron that to the back side of wool. Now that's a whole nother thing. If you've worked with cotton, you know there is a very distinct right and wrong side to printed cotton fabric. Batik, not so much. It tends to be the same on both sides. But with a screen printed cotton fabric, there's an absolute right side and wrong side. With wool, most of the time you really cannot distinguish if there's a right and a wrong side. So just put it on the side, uh, either side as you prefer. Iron that down as you would expect on a medium heat and you'll cut out on the drawn line. That's what we've done ahead of time and let me just grab that here. In fact, I can put this out of the way. These are the wonder clips that we ended up using. I didn't mention those before. These are the, the wonder clips that we ended up, once we have all of our applique done on the front and we have our applique done, our, our, our back is put together, we just clip all of this together while we're doing the blanket stitch around the edge. So that's where the wonder clips come in. Let me put that aside just to give us some space. Here's all of the, the elements to make the daffodil unit. This is where we will now use our layout diagram. Before we were using a tracing diagram, here we'll be using our layout diagram. So let's lay that on here. And this is when the applique pressing sheet comes into play. I've got my iron set to a medium heat. Just note that sometimes working with wool, a medium heat might not be enough. When I'm working with cotton consistently, the medium heat is enough. But I have noticed that because of the density of wool, I'm going through a lot of layers. A lot of times I need to go a little bit hotter than the medium, that's okay. And Tammy's also showed me that when she uses steam, it works beautifully too. And that's not something that I've been familiar with up until very recently, and it's worked beautifully. We'll get to that step just a little bit later. So we're going to be putting together a daffodil. So I have that, I'll illuminate my light box. And let's just turn it this way so I'm dealing with one that's not on the fold. Now if your diagram has a little crown on it here, sometimes what I'll do is actually just iron my diagram. I don't know if any of you do that, but it's something I've just learned along the years as a way to try to flatten it out. Now make sure you don't have any steam going because you certainly don't want to get your diagram wet. But it's kind of nice if you kind of have that crown, that crest from it being folded to just kind of flatten it out. All right, so we're gonna put our applique pressing sheet on there. Be actually, before I do that, I want you to note something. It might be easier for you to see it actually with the light off. Note how there's a number one here. Number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those are placement. That's letting you know that piece number one goes down first. Piece two, and then piece three, piece four, and so on and so forth. I know I've used plenty of other patterns where that it's not numbered. Um, and I have to kind of visualize that for myself. So we definitely here take the time to help you not have to worry about that. And we number it so all you need to do is just follow the numbers with piece number one going down first, followed by two, and so on and so forth. Um, we've got some embroidery lines drawn here. I just want to point those out to you as well. So these are embroidery lines that would come in a little bit later on. So let's put our applique pressing sheet back on. We'll turn the light box back on. And we're just going to, as we said, follow the instructions as to what's first. Now make sure you never put your hot iron on the light box. This is not glass. It will damage this with heat. And for that reason, I have my wool pressing mat right next to me. So I'm ready to go. I'm gonna put piece number one down, and let's put down piece number two and three. Put down as many pieces as you feel comfortable with. You are gonna be moving this laterally over to the pressing mat because we know that we can't, uh, we can't iron on this. Now, at this point, you might be able to 
see this diagram without the aid of the light box and be able to just be here. Sometimes I don't want to transport something. Sometimes I just want to be able to be where I need to be to do the pressing. Later on, when a design becomes where it's very difficult to see through and the light box is absolutely essential, I will be there. But in this instance, because I really want this to come right along the arc, I might be here because I can be here right now. I don't need the aid of the light box yet. So let's be at this space right now. And I'm not gonna go any further. I wanna just iron that down and kind of just anchor that for now. Let's do that. It's so important that it goes straight down. Obviously, any kind of lateral movement, any kind of swishing like we tend to do when we iron clothes is not correct in this case because it's gonna move here. It's gonna move, of course, the wool on the applique pressing sheet and it won't be where it's supposed to be. Now, you'll just wanna have that there. Again, Tammy says steam it. If, if that's gonna help get it down, go ahead and steam it. I tend to kind of wait until I've moved it onto the background wool to typically steam, but it's okay to do that now. But I don't wanna to add too much moisture to my diagram because again, it could maybe start to ruffle that just a little bit. All right, that is down. Now, let's move that aside for now. We might decide to go ahead and do the head of the flower by itself. In fact, I will do that in a separate location. I could do it here and just start adding the elements, or I could do the head of the flower and move it later. So just know you have a couple options here. Uh, let's see if we can do that without blocking our view. I believe we can. Piece number four. So let, I believe that one's in the back. It is. Now, I, consequently, I had already pulled the paper off of these, but when you get your... When you get your fusible on the back of your wool, just fold this back and peel it away. There was one piece I hadn't done yet. Now I, I am going to just do this in place because there's not really that many pieces. So let me just do this in place right here versus doing the flower head up here and out of the way. Most people don't use an applique pressing sheet in conjunction with wool. I use one when I need to, when I really want it to be just so. And as you can see from some of these designs, that's going to be essential on some of them and maybe not as essential on others. But I sure like having the option available to me. And I, I use this same applique pressing sheet for cotton as wool. I've, I've had the same applique pressing sheet for years. So they really just don't wear out. Now I will do this. I'm going to point something out to you. Notice the center of the flower is now out of my view. How are we going to manage that? Easy, with an applique pressing sheet. And that's the beauty of an applique pressing sheet. Let me show you your two options. Your two options for the kind of the flute, this portion of the flower right here, is to either A, wing it, right? I've done plenty of that where I'm like, well, I, I kind of think it's, I, I kind of think it's here, and I, I think this is my center here. And that, I can go for that. I can just iron that down. Option two would be, you know, I, I don't think I'm comfortable with winging it. I'm gonna move that off to the side for now. I'm gonna bring this in here. Now I know my center, right? You, we can see the top scallop, and we can see the bottom scallop, and we know that center is somewhere in between, right? And that's where you kind of maybe just want to take a quick visual peek. You know it's right about in the middle. There's your bottom piece. Okay, and now I'm just gonna iron that together until that's one unit, and then I can move that onto my flower. So that's the beauty of an applique pressing sheet. You can make subunits of a subunit and assemble it then 
uh, in sections so that the orientation is just right. It becomes more essential when you're doing, say, a face. Um, when we did our little snowman over here, let me bring that one into place so you can see that. You can imagine, you know, it needs to be just right. So this is where you can make the decision of whether you want to do pieces separately and bring them all in together later or kind of just, as I said, wing it. So I'm gonna let that cool down here. One thing I've definitely learned about the applique pressing sheet over the years is if I try to peel it back too soon, the glue is kind of in a transition stage and it's not ready yet. So definitely, I know it's, you wanna get going, it's exciting, but go ahead and wait till that's fully cool and I feel that is cool now. Now watch how I just peel this back. It's a slow process, but see how this is one unit now. I like that. I don't want to have to bring that to uh, in three separate stages. Now even now, it's a little bit blind. Let's see if we bring the light box into play, if that helps me see anything. This is when I have a very low visibility. I might even work on this edge real quick here. All of the daffodils and all of the crocuses are the same, so it doesn't really matter which one I work on. Now this is cool. This light box will go to an even brighter setting. Now on its brightest setting, I can actually see the silhouette right there. Do you see that? Do you see the top right here? The scallop shows me exactly where that goes. See what I was talking about is there's times when I need the light box and there's times where I can maybe work off to the side. It's when I use them together at times that I get the best result. Now I'm just gonna push this down because I gotta move it, right? Cannot iron on my, I cannot iron on top of here. I have to admit that I started doing it once because I like forgot and uh, that was not good. Let's just say that, that was not good just a little bit of steam. How fun is that? And look at that. It fits our footprint perfectly. And of course you just make four daffodils and four crocus in the same way. So while that's cooling, I'll just put that off to the side. Let's talk about the scallop. Let's talk about how are we gonna create these scallops. I'm in this program. I don't know, how am I gonna get this transferred? Piece of cake. This is where the freezer paper comes in. As I said before, if you're working on smaller shapes, the cut right freezer paper, there's nothing like it. It's this heavy duty, reusable freezer paper, I love it. It's not wide enough for a project like this. This is when using the store-bought freezer paper this is kind of in the saran wrap, the aluminum foil section of a grocery store. This is when I use this because it's wider. I have a sheet ahead of time. Before I get that, let's just peel this off so we're ready to go. I'm super excited to show you this. Look, look how it just comes off as a unit. Ready to go. Isn't that so cool? Sometimes people think applique pressing sheets are only for cotton, and as you can see, they perform beautifully with wool as well. So let's put that aside for now, and let's prepare our background, because of course, I, when I do a project, I'm so excited, I wanna jump right into the applique. I always get it done first, and then I do the background because I just wanna jump into working with the colorful wool. So we would, of course, get all of your applique shapes together, and then, we move right into working with our freezer paper. So you'll just get a sheet of freezer paper. Let's get one real quick. And as you would suspect, you're just going to trace around that line. Now, if you want the aid of the, of the light box, Obviously, it's gonna make it even that much simpler to go ahead and just trace around. Don't use a friction pen. Use a pencil, a pen, or a micron, and you'll simply trace around that scallop. Here's a cool thing that I've learned about uh, the store-bought the store freezer paper. While it's not th as thick as like the cut right, for example, what's really cool about it, 
I'm just going to show you a little bit of this. I'm just going to trace around this real fast. What I've learned about this freezer paper is it can be doubled up. So see how this is pretty flimsy. If I want to be using this again and again, because I need to cut a top scallop and I need to cut a bottom scallop, so I, need, I want this to last. Here's what I've learned about uh, freezer paper. Let's say I have a second piece of freezer paper, right? It's just the same rectangle. I've already got my shape already drawn. I'm just going to give you an example, because I don't have another piece kind of readily available. Watch what happens when this is shiny side down, shiny side down, and I iron them together. Now I have twice the strength. That's what I want. I want more rigidity as my template. You're basically building a template right now. You're like, well, how can I iron this down and peel this off? This is not a fusible product. It's more of a temporary product. It has an adhesive characteristic, but it's not permanent, like heat and bond is permanent. Here, I can just pull this up and keep heating it, and pull it up and keep heating it. And now, here's a single layer. Look at this. It's much thicker. So we did that ahead of time. So here's what it looks like. And what's nice about the freezer paper, just take it off. Unlike fusible webbing, which is permanent, this is really not permanent, and I can get my back of my project, iron this down, and cut around the scallops, and I don't have to remake the template. So this is fantastic. Of course, you'll make two of these. You'll want to do one other step, and that's really kind of to stabilize everything. It's what's called Shape Flex. Tammy found this product, and the reason we were looking for it is when we were hand embroidering some other wool projects, we noticed that when we put in the embroidery stitches, just the nature of wool is that the stitches can kind of wander a bit. They're, they, because of just the looser nature of wool, as we were stitching, especially some of our bigger kind of scrolls and shapes, the stitches would kind of go a little here and a little there. And we thought, you know, we really want to stabilize this project so that those stitches stay exactly where we want them to go. So we found a product called ShapeFlex, and we love this product. It's fusible on one side only. So on the non-fusible side, what we recommend that you do is to basically cut out the scallop, and that's going to be sandwiched behind what's the top, where you're going to be doing your applique and embroidery. However, there's one other thing that we discovered. Because the shape flex is white, if you have it come all the way to the edge of your scallops, you might be seeing some of that white. So for that reason, when you trace the shape flex out, I'll bring our light box back, we're going to trace that on the inside of that line by, say, a quarter of an inch. So let's turn our light, back, light box back on. And here you could be using a friction pen if you want to. And that way, if, you, if you're not happy with your markings, you can just uh, erase them away with some heat. So here's my drawn line. I'm just going to draw inside of that by about a quarter of an inch. And if you're a quilter, you know what a quarter of an inch looks like. It's not critical that it's a quarter of an inch, but we just, it keeps that white away from that edge. So when you have the top and the back coming together and that shape flex is in between, it's not kind of poking out at the edge and you're kind of seeing that when you look at the project from a, the side. So this is just kind of an added bonus. Again, this is not a mandatory aspect of the project. We just found it tended to stabilize our stitches. That's one of the reasons you don't have to have it all the way to the edge of the project. Is Really, the embroidery is up and away from the edge of the project. Certainly, you're doing some blanket stitch, but I'm talking lazy daisy stitches, back stitches, all of that. You're going to just trace around that, and again, you would go ahead and cut that out on the draw, in this case, cut it on the drawn line, and you'll iron that to the back of 
either piece of wool, but that will be the wool that you'll be doing your applique and your embroidery on. So let's turn that off. You get the idea of what Shape Flex is all about. So we've got our front is already done. We've got Shape Flex on the back of what we're going to call the front. We already have our black scallop that's waiting to be at the very end. And now, how do I how do I take this and my and all of my other applique shapes and get them to my my wool? Well, this is where we use of course, the light box at this point is not going to help you. It is not going to see through, no matter what we do, on its brightest setting. Well, maybe, yep. I mean, there are certain limitations to any light box. No matter on its brightest setting, I can't see that. So the light box isn't helping, but let's say you were using a lighter colored background. I would feel very confident that you can see through that and that might assist you with placement. So what we did for our project was, of course, we're just, now that this is one, one piece, think of how easy this is. I'll just get my placement here and I'm just going to adjust. I kind of just keep peeking. Does my leaf land where I want it to land? And I'm just kind of checking left and right. And I'm happy with that. Move that to your, uh, your wool pressing mat and simply iron it down. You're going to rotate your project. You'll do your next one and rotate your project and do the next one. So the, yes, there's, there are several steps, but as you can see, these are all manageable. And you know what my favorite part is? It's fun. It's fun having another substrate to be working with besides cotton. So I know this was a longer video, but I'm so glad you, you hung in there with me so I could show you one of my newest and favorite things to work on. And if you are not already a subscriber, please do that now. We're always coming out with new projects, uh, tips, tricks, tutorials, and techniques that we love to share with you. So I'll see you next time.